Um, it's called Home Bits and Pieces of uh, Profiling Management. So you can use Vision VM to connect to VM and then you can tell what's going on with the garbage collector and everything else. On top of that, you have the Java class library. So things like Java Lang and so like Java Max, uh, Swing and all pieces of software like that. That's the Java class library. And before OpenJD comes along, the pieces in the middle is obviously not open source, and uh, we have um, task path projects. We're trying to provide an open uh, source version of, of that. Um, but basically, since that comes along, since the Open JDK comes along, pretty much everybody moves on to the Open JDK class line and Open JDK VM. Uh, there's a lot of innovation in that. Um, so um, I'm not going to talk about that, but come and have a chat about that on the chat board later on. Um, and finally, your Tomcat and JBoss and all the application services sit at the top. But today, my talk uh, most uh, focus mostly on JVM server because partly this is my expertise and the other thing is that it's where the dark set is going to make a difference. Okay, um, another quick recap of. Um, so uh, what's, what's, what's different? A lot of people ask me what's the difference between all JDK and the JDK that you can actually download from Oracle's website. So the main difference is that um, there are a couple of pieces that's missing from the open source library. So Java plug in web star, so it's called Java app, that's not available in open JDK. Um, however, Red Hat is filling that gap by um, providing ice tea. Um, with, the, uh, with their own Java plugin website implementation. Um, there are proprietary components like the form rasterizer and the, um, some of the 2D stuff. Uh, it's not available in open source JDK. And what happened there is that they use um, things like free type and all the other open source libraries to replace that. So what you might find is that sometimes if you render some of the graphs and charts in OpenJDK, it might look a little bit funny at times, but in general, it's fine. Um, the other major big contention about the OpenJDK that Oracle has opened is the um, Technology Compliance Kit, which is the TCK. Why is that so special? Well, that's the uh, piece of software that you have to, the, the piece of text that you have to pass in order to slap a logo on, on your product and say it's Java compatible. If you don't pass the um, technology compliance kit, then you, your, your, your pieces of whatever JDM that you call it, you can't call it Java compatible. It's illegal from the license term. So this has caused quite a major stir with Apache Harmony because they only license the TCKs to projects that are all JDK based. So obviously Harmony and, and things like that are not come from open JDK source, it's completely clean room implementation of the specification. So uh, this caused a lot of concern and that's why we can't Apache Harmony and hasn't called itself a, a Java compatible um, implementation. Um, so another important point, point about the OpenJDK license is that it's GPL and class path. What it means is that it allows you to link your class library against the um, OpenJDK class library, link your library. Because if it's pure GPL implementation, all your Java code will become part of the uh, uh, become JGPM because obviously you link against the class library, you need to reference the class library. So this is why they've got this class path um, exception to actually allow us to run your code in OpenJDK and compile your classes in OpenJDK. And again, other than those, all the hotspot VM and class library are pretty much the same as in uh, proprietary implementation. Um, in, in my day job, I basically look at OpenJDK um, source code and it gives me a very good indication of what, what they're doing in this proprietary uh, um, um, builds. Okay, so what are the um, JDK 7 themes? Uh, because obviously it's a major release um, since 2006, 2005 when JDK 6 come out. Um, in fact, there's nothing really revolutionary in Java 7. However, it fixes quite a lot of 
annoys us with, um, with Java. Um, so it's got a um, enhanced languages support for the dynamic languages. Um, since for like five or six, last five or six years, there's been a school of languages. There's loads of languages that start running on the JDK. Um, and a, there, there are a couple of problems that I'm going to talk about uh, in terms of running those sort of like languages uh, on the JVM. And because sort of like, you know, people are moving onwards from, from, the, uh, from the Java languages, so we better support those languages to you know, keep the JVM out of um, so it is an important part of that. Um, Hotspot, which is the uh, compiler and the, uh, and the uh, execution engine um, that runs your Java application, has a lot of major improvements. Um, the interesting bits are G1 garbage lacquer. Um, in the old days, when you try to use it, you've got two types of garbage lacquer in the VM. One of them is like a throughput collector, which basically Perform really fast, it sort of doesn't use up a, quite a lot of um, CPU cycles to do garbage collection. However, it has this, uh, it has pauses um, for garbage collection to stop the world pauses. And the other type is the concurrent um, collector, which basically um, allows the application to keep going as long as possible and reduce the uh, pause time that you uh, cause by garbage collection. In the old concurrent um, uh, concurrent collector, it's it, it, once you sort of work it, once you sort of like start using it for like half a day or a day or so, what happens is that the heat will get fragmented and you will have to do a full garbage action, even though it's sort of like, no, say, sort of like no concurrent. And basically, the new G1 collector resolves that it actually split the heat into small chunks so that it's actually targeted when you actually do garbage action and it's actually improved those concurrency. Um, and it's pretty good, uh, but I'm not going to talk too much about that. If you want to know more, come and ask me. Um, the other important point also is the language uh, usability. So that's got a number of new things. So the auto closable interfaces, um, the um, also the uh, string in switch. So in the switch statement, you can now actually put a string in there, and then it will basically turn all the codes to actually do that. Um, Little syntactic sugar to sort of like keep all the developers happy, um, which is a, a one major change. Um, another new thing that sort of like I think worth highlighting is the um, new Iowa library. Uh, one of the reasons is that um, all the all the JS and things like that are sort of talking about asynchronous I/O, and Java now has an API for asynchronous I/O, which is called new I/O um, for um, uh, new I/O two. And it's actually provides quite a lot of framework for people to write this in the server, so it's worth, definitely worth looking at. Um, and also concurrency framework like fork join, which sort of build on what they have on Java 6 to actually improve um, the ways that people can develop a concurrent application. So um, I'll now move on to the main focus on my talk, is that sort of like how the JVM actually, well, why would you want to write your um, run your languages like Ruby or Python or Scala and things like that on the JVM? Well, first thing is there are quite a number of, um, uh, the JVM itself is a sort of like provide quite a lot of framework for you to do uh, run your languages. So once you target, your, once you sort of like run, uh, write your runtime in the in the Java library, uh, you get all these features for free. You get a well-defined memory model. You know when the uh, variables are going to get displayed in the uh, sort of get visible in other threads. You get um, strong typing support. You get extensive OS and platform support. So if you if your if your Language which just runs on a generally JVM uh, run, runs on JVM runtime. It'll work out the box for Linux, for Windows, and for all sorts of platform. You don't have to rewrite your uh, your sort of like JRuby the Ruby runtime to work on all those other platforms. Um, and it's proven in enterprise. It's got tons of third um, third party libraries, so messaging database drivers and things like that that you've got out the box. So you don't have to actually write all those. Um, by yourself. So this is why you should actually put in or put your language runtime on your um, on the JVM. Uh, this is a slide that's favorite by all the hotspot developers. 
and what it shows is that what kind of optimization that it does in JVM. Um, I don't know whether people are still sort of like thinking about Java in terms of 10 years ago when they didn't have the hotspot compiler and sort of like the stuff in those days when you have interpreter. Um, in fact, the hotspot engine, the JVM itself, has actually moved on so much that it's actually pretty good in terms of generating optimized x86 code. These are some of the features that uh, VM that actually do. Um, so um, let me point out a couple of them. Um, so it does loop unrolling and peeling. So it's like if you're running an interpreter, you can't actually do loop unrolling, right? Loop unrolling it means that itself actually uh, going through all the uh, loop counts and add one to it and check every single time bit. You unroll it into a couple of add instructions because uh, or a couple of instructions because you know that it's not going to overrun the loop variables. So that kind of thing is quite a, well quite a Funds sort of like C, C++ compiler kind of feature, and basically the hotspot VM can actually does that, and it does a lot more than this. Um, so this is why, and because of that, when you when you run your JRuby or Python application on the JVM, you automatically get all this kind of support for the uh, compiler from the compiler and generate all those really good code. So this is one reason why you should actually run your uh, run your uh, Python program on JVM. And here are some of the languages that actually works with JVM right now. Um, JRuby, Jonathan, that's like just a Python implementation. Um, JavaScript, so if you want to, there's a, there's a big movement going on to actually port Node.js into JVM um, with Rhino. And um, there's, a, there's actually, a, at the moment, it's not very good performance, but then um, once they actually move on to the new JVM's infrastructure support for dynamic languages, it will actually work a lot better. And then there's also PHP and things like that. Things that you probably wouldn't think of, so sort of like JVM can actually run, it's actually running on that VM now. Um, I'm just going to, um, I think I'll probably run out of time, but uh, I'm just going to point out a, a little bit of example of why um, it's difficult to actually, in the old days, it's difficult to actually implement use Ruby on the languages. Uh, so this is a short uh, example of the Ruby program. So I define three types of objects. Um, so there's a duck, there's a human, and there's an android. And each three of them can actually swim. So if you drop an android to the uh, swimming pool, it just sat, right? If you, if, you, uh, if, you, if you drop a human, then it just makes splashing noises, and if you put duck, it will pack. Okay, now the bottom part of the thing is basically my uh, main driver, so I'm trying to make it, make it swim, okay? Now, one of the things, if you notice, the whole program doesn't have any type information. In the make it swim method, it has got no information, whether it's a human, it's dark, or it's a uh, android in there. And the important thing is that the Ruby interpreter or the Ruby runtime will actually determine what that object is when you actually run the code. So, uh, uh, as most of you, you know Java, Java is a very strong typing language. So every single time you call a method, you will have to know what type it is before you can actually do it. If you write Java, you have to declare this is an object type, whatever. Rather than like Ruby, which is basically dynamic languages, which uh, allows you to put in any objects in there. As long as it's got the method defined, obviously. If I define any object that's like a swim method, it will actually tell you that, sorry, you can't run this. So how would somebody go about writing a Ruby implementation to support this kind of dynamic languages that have to change type, determine type and runtime? Well, there are a couple of ways of doing it with Bower before, before Java 7. Uh, one of the things is to use the Java language reflection, which is basically you actually query, go to the JVM query and say, hey, can you tell me the information about this class? Does this class have a swim method? What happens is that it has to go through the JVM, it has to go through the native libraries in order to work out, and it's very, very slow. Um, I'm talking about four or five times slower, so I know that one call can take about one or two seconds, that comes slow. So it's terrible. Um, the other thing is um, you can, the, well, obviously some people do reflection, but most people, what, what they will do is they generate some kind of proxy on the front. Which is basically it's like what hybrid and things like that does, and it basically generates new classes on the fly to actually call those methods. Um, and then what happens then? The, the, the performance is good. The one of the problems that it 
generated a lot of runtime classes. I don't know whether you look at um, hibernate ex uh, execution, you see it in the permanent generation, it's got thousands of thousands of proxy, SF, assessor, XYZ, so, so, on, so on and so on. And that actually is sort of like the use of memories and performance and stuff like that. So we set back away. Um, I don't have time to go for all this, but basically the evoke dynamics, uh, the instruction in Java 7, which is a new binder, allows you to actually declare the, um, uh, the, the method that you're pointing yourself, but strongly, um, strongly tied to the objects that you're calling, it provides infrastructure for you to actually in the runtime to actually switch on the different um, method uh, pointers. So you can pick up as a method pointer um, and you can actually assign method pointer um, and on the runtime to actually allow that to do much, much faster. And also because the JVM has this information, they can actually go and optimize and generate loads of really optimized code. Uh, I didn't have time to discuss that, so like, you know, the whole thing is how it works, but come and talk to me afterwards if you want. So, uh, the conclusion for my talk, um, and the, one good thing about running your languages on JV, uh, JVM 7 is that it's a mature language runtime. It spent the last 15 years um, to actually optimize it to such a point that it's really, really fast. It's enterprise proven technology, loads and loads of transactions that your, your investment bank is, uh, uh, does. It's actually doing through Java, and it's enterprise proven. It's probably one of the best optimizing native compiler. In certain cases, it's probably better than GCC, but uh, so that it's sometimes it's probably not as good, but most of the time it's pretty good. Um, you get out of the box, you get monitoring, facility, JV should VM, and all the things like that. And with Java 7 enhancement, it actually makes it even better for dynamic languages. And it's all available as open source project. So there's no reason why you should write a new VM anymore and you should all just use Java VM. Okay, so that's the end of my talk. By the way, I do have a couple of uh, Java 7 teachers of Oracle as in Kaini provide us with some Java 7 teachers. So if anybody asks some really interesting questions, I will give one to you, but uh, you, you, you will have to convince me to uh, sort of give you a teacher, okay? Thank you very much. Yes, um, you can safely, uh, 
the, so the main problem with all those sort of incompatibilities is that if you use some dot star classes, so some classes actually prefix of it, packages a some dot something or come dot some dot something, those are generally not compatible and not migratable. So uh, sometimes they might appear in Java 5 or just come dot some dot image IO, but then when you move on to Java 6 or Java 7, those classes might be gone. But if you stick to using standard classes like Java, that can't be those are compatible if you comply with all JDK or work with JDK 7 and vice versa. But other than those sort of like you know, the private classes, it's all compatible. Do you want a large meeting? Large or medium? Um, the Okay. 